The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, you are back in the House of Mystery, and I am Al Warren in the middle of the bushfires. And I'm still here. See, I, I, I care about my listeners and about getting paid. And uh, <laughs> and of course, David, he's he's over there, you know, enjoying the the sun and you know, ninety degree heat, yeah, doing his nails and <laughs> he's in his little summer dress and he's just having a good old time, you know. I am. You know, that, that is true. That is true. And uh, <laughs> yeah, purple, it's your color. And yeah. and today we've got a returning guest who's uh, really it's it's the morning and uh, he's in. Australia. So, Mr. Garrick Jones, thanks for coming on. Good day. Good morning. Yes. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Well, thank you for being here. No, it's um, uh, it, this is wonderful. So, you've got another book coming out. You're you're really getting into this uh, writing uh, thing. Yeah, this book was written. I think uh, this is the eleventh version, the final published version. It was written in uh, two thousand and fourteen. So I spent a lot of time amongst those books that I wrote before I even thought I was good enough to get anything published. So been sitting there for ages, and then when the first book in the series was taken up by a publisher, um, uh, that's when it all sort of kicked off. So I've been working on that, on that, and that's coming out now. Uh, next, next. 3rd of September, whenever that is, next Thursday in the U.S.? I don't know. It's all over. Yeah, I, don't know. I know. It's all I never get it. Um, but it's all the same. So this is the book two, right? Now, the, yep. now the first book is the, um, the what is that, the 7th, 7th of December, December series. That's right? right, yeah. This is the World War II spy adventure thriller. It's written in a sort of a boy's own adventure style with lots of action and... Uh, you know, spies, thrilling, Nazis, bullets, bombs, all that exciting stuff. It's done very, very well, this book. I reissued it in a new edition um, in December last year because the original publisher folded and the reverts for, rights were reverted to me, so I rehashed it together to the original version before they'd done their edit on it, reinstated a big prologue and a couple of characters that they cut. So then that allowed me to move forward and rewrite the second book. Um, which has been edited by the same editor in the UK. Um, and, yeah, it sort of takes on immediately after the end of the first book and in April in 1941 and continues through to the 7th of December 1941. And we all know what happened then, on that no. day. Well, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> no, you, gotta, you know, education level in America is not as what it used to be. That's just well, certainly that. people That's remember true. Pearl Harbor, invasion yeah. of yeah, bombing of Pearl Harbor. Surely. No, that's a new type of headwear or neck. Really? <laughs> oh, dear. The day that live in infamy. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Well. Mm. So now this book is called X for Extortion. Extortion. Yep. Ooh. I mean, spot of X. I, I can't really <laughs> explain why without giving the plot away. Oh. But, yeah, because the title... And funnily enough, even the colour of the print of the title on the cover is all linked into the larger story. So that's why it's a part of a big mystery. We don't find out what the X for extortion actually means until probably about a third of the way through the book and when um, the main focus, the main plot mystery unfolds. But again, it's um, another book about, you know, Nazi infiltration of Great Britain uh, during the war and blackmail and assassination attempts. Got all that good, you know, jungle gym stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what, what got you into doing this kind of writing? It's different. Uh, than... This book, I, I don't know if I explained when I did the first interview about the 7th of December for you, but my godfather, who was a gay man, he, he met his uh, American boyfriend of 62 years in London in 1942 at a nightclub and uh, he was working for one of the intelligence agencies uh, during the Second World War and he left a diary. So I have this diary of everything that happened to him from 1940, 1938 when he first arrived at Britain right through to the end of the war and uh, how he met his lovely man Charlie. Um, they both died within six weeks of each other. It was very you know, amazing relationship. But um, there was a nightclub in um, 
in London called the Rainbow Corner, which was set up by Americans during the war for their servicemen to have as a social club. And quite often, um, because, you know, there were dancers and there were stuff that women would come in and they would get pick, pickpocket crowds in and prostitutes and stuff. So every so often the MPs would clear the place out of the women and all the men would dance. But what they do is get a, an armband. So if you got an armband a band of blue, that meant you were the male dance partner. And the next yeah. dance you gave it to the other guy and he was the, the male partner. So there was, it was quite accepted if there weren't any women around, that they were just all these all-male dancers who gave the guys a chance to um, dance. And my godfather, Doug, found himself in the arms of this six-foot-two, blue-eyed, crew-cutted American pilot. And that was history, as I could say. <laughs> and they were together for 62 years. So a lot of the, the, the stories are based around what happened to him, not actual stories, but the atmosphere of what went on during London, during the Blitz and during the war. And he was sent over to be part of the Nuremberg trials at the end of the war too, um, which is when the whole series will eventually end up when I finish writing the last book. Uh, you, you know, and, I, and I'm kind of joking earlier, but not really, you know, when you say everybody should remember Pearl Harbor and the date. I, I, I get a lot of people that we do shows um, more on the serious side, you know, talking about the Admiral and some of his relatives were on the one that got demoted and during Pearl Harbor. And we, we've covered a lot of topics in the World War One and Two. I'm 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 constantly surprised at how many people really don't know that history. Oh, it's extraordinary. I mean, I think we have a greater, um, because we have a national day of remembrance, we call it Anzac Day, um, which is the day that celebrates um, our first major battle in the First World War at Gallipoli, and that's celebrated nationwide. The whole country closes down, and there are dawn services that pretty well most people go to. There's still a big national connection to, to our servicemen. Um, it's not treated as a holiday where there are barbecues. I think Memorial Day is a bit different in the US, isn't it? There's a bit more yeah. sort of family yeah. gathering stuff. and But no, here it's really totally focused. Right? So there's a lot more awareness. We're also ta taught um, our history at, at school, both in primary school and high school. So a lot more awareness. I, there wouldn't be anybody in this country who didn't, was not aware of um, both Gallipoli and Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 sadly, I, I have the feeling that it's not the same. Uh, it's not quite the same in the U.S. It, I can just tell by the, um, you know, the people that write in and what they say about it and the questions they ask, you start to realize that they really had no, very little information on it, which surprises me because I would think they'd learn a lot more of it in school. It would still be there, but maybe a lot of it's gone. I don't know. But, see, the other thing is, too, that um, I, I don't know if you, I told you, but I went to school in both Seattle and Vancouver in high school. And I was just astounded by the parochial nature of history teaching, for example, and geography, where everything was North America um, concentrated. So there was no real discussion of what happened in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries or in East Asia, whereas our schooling is far more uh, Catholic, it was so, far more universal. So we didn't not only study our own history, but we studied the history of other countries. So I think we're a little, we were, I don't know what it's like now, but certainly people of my age are much more aware of history worldwide. Mm, yeah. Did you guys, did you wear a little dress too, like the Catholic school girls? No. no. Oh. We, wore a, a, <laughs> we wore a proper uniform with a boater and a bow tie and a blazer and all of that polished shoes and brilliant seed hair. I actually got sent over to school because I didn't have brilliant hair, brilliant in my hair one day. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. <laughs> no, I just said, but it's pretty funny, eh? Boy times have changed. Yeah. You know, they show up with a, you know, Metallica t shirt on. And <laughs> mm. uh. <laughs> that was the 80s. <laughs> that was the 80s. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been back, but, you know. But they, they still do in this country. A lot of the private schools still have uniforms like that. Like, you imagine old British schools with all of the kids in a proper dress uniform. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure there's some private schools like that, too. I, I, I don't know how far it's gone. I guess I'm kind of talking out of turn in that way. But um, So when you're telling these stories, what, do you, what is it you kind of 
are you just trying to get your stories across from... Look, my, my, I was asked this very same thing very recently because this will be my eighth book out and the interviewer said they're all about gay people. They're all gay stories. I said, well, no, they're not actually gay stories. They're just stories in which the protagonists just happen to be gay people. And they don't define themselves by their sexuality. It's just who they are. Um, and the interviewer was, said, can you please explain more? And I said, well, you're probably not aware, but out there around you there are probably hundreds of bricklayers and judges and policemen and whatever who go home to a partner of the same sex and they don't make a big thing about it. That's just, you know, part of who they are. It doesn't define who they are. That's not what they're all about. They're not all about being a gay person. They just happen to be a person who has a preference um, sexually for people of the same sex. So I suppose that's what the aim of my books are about. And also to sort of educate that um, when I wrote the Clyde Smith books, the one set in the 1950s, that it wasn't all doom and gloom and hiding in the cupboard. We, the McCarthyism wasn't rampant worldwide, that people did get on with their lives and they lived more or less like you and I do today, except much more privately. That's, I suppose, the, the feature behind my writing, what I feel anyway. Yeah, and I think that's important. It's an important aspect because a lot of people think that um, it's just all about you know, dresses and drag queens, but there, there's a lot of people that just live their life that happen to be gay, right? They they do what they want to do. And, well, yeah. you've only got to look at people like J. Edgar Hoover, you know, like really, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there he was living with, uh, I forgot to that guy's name, I can't remember, I've forgotten um, what his lover's name yeah. was, all those yeah. years living together, and the general public in the U.S. didn't know. And why should they? What did it have to do with anything? Yeah, hmm. well, yeah, because yeah, you're there to do a job, and and you have to have an image, especially back then. Um, but it's it's kind of a, a funny situation in in a case like that. Um, um, I think it surprises people, and then they try to not believe it, almost deny it. Yeah, yeah, we I, I, we need a whole lot more courageous people to just acknowledge that they have a male partner. Um, I'm sure that the football leagues in America are full of gay men. I mean, when I say full, but there's probably more than one, that recent guy that just came out recently, yeah. more than one. I mean, there must be, you know, dozens all over the country. And there must be professional tennis players and all sorts of other athletes. Um, so what's the big deal? I mean, honestly, a lot of straight guys need to have a really good look in the mirror and, and own up that they are not an object of desire for every gay man in the world. Yeah, well, the football players are. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. Uh, but you know that thing about, you know, the, the homophobia, about oh, I don't want a gay guys touching me? Yeah, yeah. Sister, sister go look at yourself, you know. Yeah, yeah it's. Get yeah. a grip. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the idea, you know. It's like, oh, just don't do anything gay around me, okay? Yeah, well, um, so um, you go and. But just going on from that subject, conversely, the, the mirror side of this is featured in this book. There's a character in it who pretends to be a sissy gay man um, to get girls comfortable in his company. And then when they're really company, the guards down and they've had a few drinks, that's when he seduces them. So, you know. Yeah. He gets the old, I've never done this before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but you, you focus your books, a lot of a lot of your books, you're focused all on the past quite a bit. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, is, it, is it that you like the times better back in the, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and all that? Well, or? I think that there are, for every person who writes a contemporary novel, uh, every person who writes an historical novel, there are about 5,000 who write a contemporary novel. So you're fighting against a bigger market. I don't know that I have a voice to reflect about what's going on now because I'm a 73-year-old man who lives by himself in a regional town in, you know, in Queensland in Australia and I don't really know a lot about what's going on in contemporary culture. Um, yet I do know a lot about what happened in the 1950s, 60s and 70s because that's when I grew up. I also wanted very much to explore that whole legacy of broken men from the Second World War that I grew up with, that guys who came back from the Second World War who were told to man up and shut up, 
and just get on with lives and forget what had happened to them. So the, we have we have this thing called PTSD now, which has always existed but never was focused upon in the past. So when I grew up, every, every one of my uncles, my father, my grandfather, the neighbours, all of those men that I grew up with were, were all guys who'd been through terrible traumatic experiences and spend most of their, their lives like as coiled up as a spring trying to not let, it, let it out. And I wanted to explore in my books that, um, that mentality of trying to be a man and also being a gay man, and yet just getting on with life with all of this past history behind you. It's a very fascinating period, that 1950s. You know, the, in the 1960s and after, after the Vietnam War, men were allowed to be disturbed mentally, but you weren't allowed to be like that in the 50s. Yeah. You know, you, you would be sort of locked, locked away or, or lobotomized or something. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing how it's changed. Um, it, it's it's really interesting. So when you go through each story, like when you finish this X for Extortion, like this is another book that you had previously written that you've kind of redone. How does how does doing each book change you? Um, what it does, I when when you read a series, this is my own personal philosophy. When I read a series, I want to discover more about the people, what makes them tick. I, I don't want to read um, books that are not about the personalities and, and, and what drives them to do what they do and who they are. So I expect in every book in a series for you to discover more about that person, more of their backstory, more of what makes them who they are, which then I think allows the reader to engage more with the main characters. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. There's, there's so many that, that don't give you enough. You know, so that's good. Um, and well, I think that those books serve a particular purpose. If you were at an airport and you just wanted a quick read on a plane and there's no character development, it's just story, 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 that's fine. But I think if you write a book that deserves to be read, or then you, you need that sort of uh, development within it. I think they call those romance books, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I said that. No, David said that. So. <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah, send him the, yeah, send him the email. He reads all this. <laughs> That's right. I, I tell you why, though. There, there is a group on Facebook called uh, Quilt Bag Historials, Historics, which is a group of the Q-U-I-L-T-B-A-G stands for various parts of queer, lesbian, asexual, by whatever, um, and they're about the group of writers who write historical novels, and a lot of those writers write um, what I call semi-romances, historical, but pretty well most of them have a lot of strong character for development in them. So there, there's room for both. Yeah, there is. I, I think uh, typically you don't get that more so much in some of those books, but no, you don't get them in the what do you call the corset rippers or bosset bodice rippers? I'm not yes. sure what you call them in the US. They're all different names everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Barbara Cartland type books. I think that's what we believe, don't we? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I just want, but they, so you go quite into the character development. You go quite into the, uh, especially like you were saying, how the, that time period, um, it wasn't very, um, let's say, popular. Um, for men to show their feelings. Well, it wasn't accepted socially. I mean, it was really frowned upon. And in fact, um, what people forget is that the, all of the um, societal anti-gay stuff that sort of went on in the 1950s happened in whispers between, between closed doors because it was considered really impolite and rude to talk about people in public um, in social gatherings, uh, if, if a woman got an, a reputation as a gossip or as a man is spreading lies, you know, they'd be, we, they wouldn't be invited anywhere anymore. So all of that stuff happened behind, behind closed doors um, in, you know, husbands and wives nattering away or women having afternoon tea together. But even then, women uh, ran the risk of being ostracised if they were considered to be telling stories. It wasn't polite. It wasn't part of who you were supposed to be. But I guess that would put a – the Times also put a lot of pressure on people because, like, you, you know, especially in this, you've got the Nazis, you, you know, the, the war, you've got spies, you've got all these things going on, assassination. Those times um, – because a gay man was looked as just feminine, right? 
uh, or there's something wrong with them. Well, that's what society saw them as, but you know, we all know that that's not the case. No, but it, it, in the in the picture, like if you took someone in the fifties or even the sixties and you said, "Oh, that's James Bond," and yeah, he's he's gay, uh, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work for the public, but it would work with aware people because they'd realise that you know that gay people are everywhere; they do everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, well, people in the inn, but in the general uh, public, they would be kind of, you know, he's light in the loafers or whatever yeah. saying that they have. That would be kind of... Well, look, I think that's a problem with all heterosexual movie producers. They really want to... They really get... I, I recently watched, uh, re-watched a movie called Hamam. I don't know if you've seen it, The Turkish Bath. It's a, it's a Turkish-Italian collaboration set in Istanbul in the, in the 80s and 90s about an Italian married man who goes um, to Istanbul to see about the house he's inherited from his aunt and it turns out to be a steam bath. Oh. And, he, and he falls in love with um, the son of the family who are running it. And it's a really, you know, terrific story. It's really beautifully, beautifully filmed. But then at the end of the movie, this guy gets killed. And I thought to myself, that's so indicative of straight, movie making thinking that gay people always have to end up badly either with bad relationships they end up dying of AIDS or they end up getting stabbed or you know wrecked by the police and hung but so straight men reinforce their own sexuality by putting gay men down and I think that needs to change a lot we need much more positive gay messages in movies and television so we don't have this sort of subtle homophobia running underneath or we're given lip service for being gay, you know, a little wink and a nod, like the third character in the cast just happens to be this sissy queen rather than, you know, the, the bodybuilder who bashes down walls with his fist. <laughs> do, you, do you follow my drift? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, of course. Well, you got to keep making some movies. What are you doing writing books? Yeah, but you think of all of the, you think of all of the big... Um, movies lately like Brokeback Mountain I mean that's a yeah. wonderful the, the book is amazing if you haven't read the book read Annie Peru's short story it's only really really short but it's so gritty I, I didn't find the movie gritty at all I found the movie a little romantic and sad at the end but you know there, there was another movie about gay men which was sad Philadelphia another gay movie that was sad you know where are the where are the big movies that celebrate gay men being happy well, because it's not a good life to choose. No matter what, you're going to end up in a bad situation. <laughs> yeah. <it? laughs> and as long as we keep telling those stories, people will believe it. The main, mainstream people will believe it. We need, we need serious, positive role, role models in politics, in sports, in the arts, and we need it in our literature and in our films. That's my platform. I'm running you, for president. You run. You go. <laughs> you go. Uh, you know, but, but do you think it's, I don't know, do you think that's going to be, I think it's easier said than done. Um, oh, look, I think it, it'll take a long, long time. And you think how far we've come. I mean, when I was growing up in the 1950s, the idea of the men getting married was just like, what? Hmm. Now, and that's 50 years later on, 60 years later on, who knows what's going to happen? We might go through another one of those revolutionary social changes where all of a sudden, you know, we're all witch, burning witches and you know, and, and de decapitating gay people. Who knows? You know, history has a way of rolling around in circles. The wheel turns, and maybe we'll revisit that, or maybe we'll return to an age like the Romans and Greeks where being gay is just a normal, accepted part of homosexuality, sexuality. Yeah. And there isn't such a phobia. I mean, what are straight people afraid of, for God's sake? I have no idea. I have no idea what gay straight men are afraid of from gay men. I, what... what yeah, well, it it's, I think me. it's no, but I, you know, t t I think it's got, um, I don't know, it's got a label, it's got an idea that if someone is gay, they're all of a sudden feminine, or they're all, or they're interested in you and they want to, you know, ravage your children or something. That's the other ridiculous. Well, yeah, notion. that's the, you know, that's kind of the more of a evangelical point of view, right? That, you know, our agenda is to steal their children, but uh, if they like, only knew, yeah. You know, it's the dad. Um, but, but if, if, but to be honest, like, why can't? Well, I don't know. I don't think that'll ever change. But I think that um, the image of being gay, of being feminine, by 
by letting a man have sex with you. I guess that, I don't know, it's it's still got a, a negative, I don't know, it yeah. thought. One, one of the biggest drag queens, most famous drag queens in Australia is a, a, a woman called Carlotta. And back in the... Um, Back in the 1960s, they're, they're one of the big drag shows in Sydney used to tour all of the, the veterans clubs in Australia putting on drag shows. So do you, the veteran clubs, we call them the RSL, the Return Soldiers League clubs. And Carlotta said the number of times she was hit on by straight men in these places, she'd take them home, um, home to the hotel and the first thing they do is take their pants on and lay on their backs. I mean... <laughs> you have a story involved and um, are you choosing all your stories from your uncle uh, no not all it's sometimes when I'm doing the research for um, for the books each of the individual books I, I discover something that's um, that leads me on to an idea of thinking well you know this, this would be very easy for this character to end up involved in this particular type of situation, and how would that advance our understanding of him and also drive the story? Wow. So you really think this out. Um, oh, look, I do think I've got the, the seven books uh, of the, this particular series, the war series, already um, fleshed out. I've written the first four. first two have been published. Um, the next two need revisiting, and the next three are all uh, have the, the lines drawn out, the... Um, the storylines drawn out and notes made for them, and the, I intend the steer, series to finish at the Nuremberg Trials in 1946. So it'll encompass, encompass the entire period of the war and this relationship of these two men throughout that period. I'm wondering too, uh, when you're writing your characters, has have you ever had a character uh, do anything that uh, surprised you? Oh, all the time. I, I, this morning, um, when I got out of bed, I just went through. Um, a couple of thousand pages, pages, a couple of thousand words I'd written yesterday, <laughs> and I go, where the, where the bloody hell did that come from? Wow. <laughs> yeah, great, that's a great idea. Now, I, sometimes I don't plan these things to happen, but the characters speak in your mind so much, all of a sudden they, have, they mm. take over, and you find yourself writing stuff, and you're going, why did I put him in that situation? And then all of a sudden, you know, the next day while you're having a shower or you're doing gardening or something like that, you go, ah, now that's why I, I have been doing this. And you, you mm. find out you've de developed a whole you know, parallel universe in your mind, in your unconscious that's been hammering away inside to get out. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, mm. So <laughs> you hear your... your, your um, Characters, how? What do you? What's your relationship with your characters? Um, I base them on particular people in my life, or people that I know, that in my family, or people that I know very, very well. There, there. Are, for example, Clive in the Clyde in the Clyde Smith series, the detective, um, has aspects of my uncle, uh, of my godfather who was in World War person, of course, but uh, he was, um, had, he had a, a whole circle of pals um, in the 1950s, a whole lot of, that, that's how people got together, private gatherings at homes, and often as a kid I'd be invited along to go and see, and there was a particular famous tennis player who played um, um, na internationally, uh, who was a gay man and nobody ever knew, and he was the, I suppose the heartthrob of my early teen years before I realised why he was a heartthrob. But he was just like this really sort of blokey bloke. And, and when I heard about what he'd done during the war and um, what he did um, to supplement, because tennis was then amateur sport, he worked for um, a, a small investigations bureau, um, mainly on divorces, trying to take pictures of people in bed together and stuff. But, you know, that's where I based the Clyde Smith character. Um, and then, of course, my the um, Tommy, who's the main character in the X for Extortion um, series, is a violinist, and he's based on a wonderful, wonderful Russian violinist called uh, Kirill Trusov. And then he's a mix between Kirill and my godfather. Huh. Why did you pick that character, like the violinist? Well, when you, um, 
if you have a look, I've ever looked him up and have a look on him. He's got the look the way I describe Tommy in the book. He looks exactly like him, and the way he plays the violin speaks to me in the same way that I can write about it when Tommy's playing the violin. The, mu- the series is very music-oriented. Um, um, there's a little bit more in this book because Tommy's cover becomes more and more as a concert violinist rather than as a, uh, a, you know, an out-and-out wrestle with Nazi spy. That happens as the in the life, but his cover is the concert violinist, which allows him to travel everywhere. There's a, quite a big section where he goes to Boston, where I lived for a number of years, so I was able to write about that with a bit of verisimilitude. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's also based a little bit on Noel Coward, who worked for the OSS, the American Secret Service, during the Second World War. Noel Coward um, worked... Um, trying to raise morale. He played at concerts because he spied all over Europe while he was entertaining troops and while he was playing in, uh, and singing in America. Yeah, so there's a whole combination of things that draw them together. And then when you formulate the character in your mind, to me that person becomes live and their voice is completely different than anybody else's in the story. Mm. I think having been a performer on the stage for 30 years, that one, it's very easy to learn to to immerse yourself into another personage. And that's what I think has helped me write such different voices for each of my main characters. Where do you draw from for the Nazis or for the, for the, for the bad people in the story then? Oh, well, I lived in Germany off and on for 30 years. So, <laughs> um, no, the people were, you know, absolutely wonderful. And, but I arrived there in 1972 where there were still bomb sites everywhere and, um, people were still, young people were still bearing the scars of what they lived through. There was evidence of the war everywhere. And there's this incredible feeling of shame and guilt. Um, and also um, a lot of reading, a lot of um, history reading and research into the period. Hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how, uh, how Germany has actually dealt with uh, um, the whole Nazi thing and, and the war, you know. Yeah, well... None of us are our brother's keepers. None of us are responsible for what our parents did. Um, you know, that whole thing of, you know, if a father commits a murder, then the son's guilty. That doesn't really work morally. Um, and so these people who were born after the war or, or weren't participants during it, they shouldn't carry the guilt of what another complete generation did. They could be shameful for what happened, but... The fact that they had no participation in it shouldn't make them accept responsibility for what other people did. I mean, do you take responsibility for the the lynchings of black people in the U.S.? No, or but the, I'm, Cana- the I'm Mac- Canadian. Yeah, but I was going to say, you cut me off before I could finish. Or, yeah. or the, the massacres of, of, of the native tribes in Canada, you know. Right. You, can't, right. you can't take personal responsibility <laughs> for that. No, but I, I was watching a documentary yesterday, and uh, it was quite well. They had uh, Germans and Jews put together now, and it's interesting how they have a lot of um, memorials set up throughout so many places in Germany. Oh, for that, sure. And it's not it's not a memorial to um, go and worship or take a picture. It's just some, it's a reminder. Like they put street signs where like Jews weren't allowed to do this or a female Jew couldn't come to this store. They just put signs throughout. And for them, it seemed like the primary thing was not so much to look back and go, you know, and feel guilty, but it's to remind them not to to, to have that happen again. Yeah, I, I, look, I think that's amazing. And I think that we need that in more Western countries because what's happened in your country and in uh, the USA and in Australia and in UK a lot is this, like not learning the lessons of history, of going down this path of plutocracy where money is everything and ruling by ruthlessness rather than, it, than reading back into history and seeing what the results of that ruthlessness can bring. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of what I mean. I mean, they have the memorials set up everywhere, and they're not like a big, huge statue, nine eleven sort of thing. It's just there's little, they put little reminders throughout everywhere, and little common places, and streets and areas, so that you, it's just there. So you 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 you're always aware of something like that. Whereas like, 
you know, when we talk about history at the beginning and laughing about the world war and not people not remembering it, it's not that far off. There's so many people that don't really. They're, they're, no, it's not. It's not yeah. that long ago, really. Yeah. Um, I was reading yesterday that the year 1980 was as far from 1939 as it is from mm. 2021. You know, same number of years. So I remember distinctly 1980. I mean, for heaven's sake, I was nearly 30. So uh, people who were 30 in 1980, uh, you know, will remember the war period, the, the growing up it was children during the war. So it mm. puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Totally. Absolutely. And, of course, we forget now we haven't had a global conflict as such, apart from the war on terror, for 80 mm. years. I mean, something that's taken over every waking moment of everybody's day life with rationing for everybody and all sorts of... We haven't had that. So people have forgotten and that they tend to see in their minds things like the second wall in, in black and white as if they're watching a movie mm. that are at one remove rather than people like me who grew up at the end of it, who were brought up in the, in the aftermath. I mean, we still had rationing when I was a tiny kid and we had blackout paper on the, on the windows that didn't mm. come down for years and years because people didn't get round to it. And, you know, so there was a constant reminder of something that had just happened. But, um, I still do. Do you? <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I still got my grandmother's wartime cookbook on my shelf in the kitchen. <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of these, these darker aspects and stuff, yep. um, after writing fiction, especially dark scenes, um, do you have a way to decompress or, you know, do you even need to decompress? Can you just move on to the next I can, uh, I can pretty well move on. I've had a couple. When I was writing um, uh, the last Clive Smith book, which was all about childhood abuse um, in the 1950s in institutions, I do, and I was interviewing these guys who'd been through that. I just, like, I had to take days off. I was just so... It was such a cathartic experience hearing these men's stories because I couldn't put actually in the book what happened to these guys. It was just like too horrific. And you wonder, you wonder in your mind why somebody who's supposed to be a, a religious person, a priest or a, a minister, can actually do to a young, vulnerable child and yet think that's all right. And these guys, that, that, that made them into who they are. It's a wonder they, the four guys I interviewed didn't turn out to be axe murderers, you know, what they went through. Yeah. Hmm. At least if you're an adult, you can resist. But you're, if you're a seven- or eight-year-old boy and you've got some, you know, 50-year-old priest jumping on you, there's very little you can do. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, there are parts where I have to decompress. Um, the Clyde Smith book... Definitely. And when I was writing Wheelchair, the contemporary one about the guy with OCD and PTSD, there were a couple of times in that where I really had to take a few days and pull myself together. Mm. I don't think that's a bad thing, because if you're writing about mm. emotions, then you need to actually feel them to be able to put them on the page. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got to be real, so it's got to come from somewhere real, and so it will affect you. you yeah, know. a lot of people don't like that writing, of course. No. Um, I just had a review very recently that I, I'm still laughing about. It says, I really like your books, but you have to read them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough thing to do. It yeah, really you know, I, it hmm. obviously it's a skim reader who yeah. doesn't, you know, <laughs> they're glancing down the page trying to follow a story that they're going to miss an awful lot. <laughs> I only buy books for the pictures. <laughs> do they still publish those sorts of books, do they? They are. They are. You know, they're usually in the Walmart bargain bin. But <laughs> I thought they were in the, your local adult store. I thought you well, those sort of two. Books. <laughs> those two, but, you know, um, you know, Dave buys them all up. You can't yes. get them. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, can, can I ask you a guy, think, uh, you a thing about um, eroticism in books? You know, how you two feel about that. Here's a question coming from the interviewee mm. to the interviewers. What, what do you feel about that in, in sort of mainstream or even mystery? What's your take on eroticism in books? Well, for me personally, I could take or leave it. I'm not interested in it. Um, it depends. Like if it's, uh, if it's based on, if it's just about sex, and the erotic, then I'm not really interested. I lose, I lose interest real fast. So um, it's not going to catch me. I mean, if you have, um, if you have a good story, and there's some erotic parts to it, and they belong there, like they're there for a reason, then it works. 
Um, but I'm not discounting the people that do that work because what they do mm-hmm. is they, they have an audience that likes that, and so so be it. But yeah. it's, not, it's not my taste. I, I only ask this because in an inter- interview I did really recently, the in- interviewer said to me, um, what would you say to people who would criticise Clyde, that's the Clyde Smith detective, as being promiscuous? And I said, hang on a second, this guy's uh, 37, he started having sex when he was 16 and he slept with four men in 20 years. Why, why would you call that promiscuous? Yeah. It, it sort of left me nonplussed. I said, um, I, I said, I hate to say this, and it might sound misogynistic, but you're looking this, at this from a woman's point of view, aren't you? I said, um, most men, even straight men, will probably sleep with more, four, more than four partners in their life before they settle down, yeah. Yeah, especially in, these days. Yeah, so I, I just really wondering about it because it really threw me for six. I never thought about it. I thought, well, people would just expect that if you have, don't have the consequences of getting pregnant and you're gay men and, you, and sex is available pretty well, Whenever, then it's just you know yeah. you take you take your choices. Yeah. You either go well, I only sleep with people I'm really really attracted to, or I just need to do it. And find <laughs> someone. <laughs> Release. Yeah. Release. <laughs> wow. You know. You know. And then Dave. Dave. What do you you like all that all that smut stuff? Don't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not. <laughs> I think I think it needs this. You know, it needs to support the story of the story. It needs to support I, yeah. it. I think you're right. I think it needs to advance the plot. You know, mm-hmm. if you're reading an interesting book and you just come across a whole dump of sexual scenes that have got nothing to do with anything, they don't tell you about the mm-hmm. characters that are doing it. Doesn't lead to anything. Then why is it there? You know. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think it should be. It's fine in its own particular re- function. Like so, people that want to buy that and read that, that's there. But yeah. it's, it's certainly not. It can't be a major part of the story unless there has some real meaning to it. If there's a reason that oh well, somebody gets stabbed mi- mid coitus or something, you know. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, then there's then there's a point to it, you know. Like if a, a guy's sleeping with this woman, he's really really into her, and they seem to be having a terrific time, and then all of a sudden she, I don't know, bites his tongue off, and then somehow shoots him. I say, I don't know. That would <laughs> would make sense. Yeah, because it, yeah. it would be describing a lead-up that you think is going to be really passionate, and it ends with some storyline coming yeah. out of it. Yeah, or if he's or if he's got some weird fetish or something that uh, is causing mm. him to do things. Yeah, to well, I'm, I'm struggling yeah. to find weird fetishes these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, see, you see stuff and you go, "Oh, really? That again?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they haven't been in my mind, but <laughs> <laughs> much. <laughs> oh, that's me. Um, but that's it's it's pretty interesting. What do you think your most important book is that you've written? The one I think is the most important um, is the House with a Thousand Stairs. That's the story of a guy who comes back um, in 1947 at the end of the First World War um, to find that his brother has run down the family farm, has disappeared with all the money, and he's left with this big sheep station that he has to try and revive. And it's a story about him connecting through the la- to the land um, and to his home with the help of his neighbours and his childhood friend who's an Indigenous Australian policeman. And it delves into that looking through the Indigenous culture through a white man's eyes and trying to understand how the Australian Aboriginals treat the land as part of their being rather than something that they just use as a resource. I think that was a really, it's had a great, great deal of um, uh, very positive feedback. Um, and I, yeah, I felt very moved writing about it because there's this, when you write about the spirituality of any nation, that is a, not about vengeance, killing, all that sort of stuff as Christianity and Islam seems to be these current days. It's all about really love and peace and connection with nature, then it, it really was very immersive and moving. And I also had to go through a big process with the local Indigenous councils to get approval to write about some of the stuff. Um, wow. we, have very, we have very strict laws in Australia about what you're allowed to write and what you aren't if you're a non-Indigenous person. 
So, yeah, it was a great, and um, people really loved that book. There's been some wonderful feedback. It's, it's a really good read. I, I highly recommend it if you want a, a feel-good movie because it's about rebuilding community by engaging with community. And I'm not saying it just because it's my book. Well, obviously I'm saying it's because it's my book, but, you know. We can definitely all use uh, more positive things, definitely. Yeah. Do you, um, do you read anything or have any influences um, that might surprise your fans? Oh, yeah, I love sci-fi. I don't read mm. right sci-fi. Um, I read a lot of sci-fi. I read a lot of... Uh, there's a, an American female crime writer called Tammy Hoag, who you may not have heard mm. of. Yeah. I, I love her books. I've read everything that she has. I just like her writing style. I like the fact that she writes about a very strong, capable woman trying to mm. succeed in a man's world. It gives you a sort of feeling of what it's like a bit to be a gay man trying to survive in a straight mm. man's world. Um, I also re read a lot, a lot of history, you know, a lot of history books. Um, uh, I've just My next book out is uh, a spy thriller set in uh, 1955, 1855 in London, the end of the Crimean War, and the amount of research I had to do on that, and God, was it fascinating, big time, that whole mm. birth of hospitals, you know, the Florence Nightingale thing, the building of the first big sewerage system in London, the you know, underground transport starting to be built, connection of railways. Um, yeah, so I love history. I'll read anything about history. Um, and I also have a number of uh, books written by uh, fellow authors who buy my books, and I, I go out of my way to buy a copy of their books if they buy one of mine, because if a friend of mine opened a coffee shop, I'd go and buy a coffee there to support them whether I like their coffee or not. And I feel it's a bit of a duty, you know, if you've got a pal who's a writer who write, 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 reads your books, um, I'll buy a book of theirs. And slowly I'm getting through those. I just put them in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so when, I, when, I, when I visit you, I'll see all stack of my books next to oh, the, yeah. the toilet. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. They're, gonna, yeah they're, they're in the basement toilet, too. <laughs> well, nice. Oh, that's the good one. Uh, yeah, any, any, excuse, any excuse to get me down to your basement, I know. That, that's, that's, yeah, the hot tub's there. I mean, this is the, the real you know, royalty. Um, so how, so um, website, let's give out your website. Where, yeah. where do they find you? It's www, all one word, garrickjones.com.au. Mm. We all have that linked up as well so people can find you in one click. And, yeah. Uh, what, what's your grinder? <laughs> uh, well, funny enough, I don't have grinder. I don't. Um, oh. I'm one of those old-fashioned people, you know. That before the internet happened, <laughs> when we met people, it was really socially. We met them uh, at some social venue. We didn't pick up the phone and go, "Oh, yeah, that guy looks all right." Looking at a photograph that was taken 20 years <laughs> through, a, like a, through a Vaseline-smeared lens in the dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's no, how I, I do all my. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not into uh, into internet hookups or anything like that. That's, no, I, I know. To me, the attraction has always been. I call myself a sapiosexual. I've been always interested in um, very intelligent yeah. people who can hold conversation and and interest me intellectually. And then the physical things seems to come after mm. that. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's a better connection anyway. You know, you know, it's better. Um, yeah, and, and so I, I'll officially give you permission. You can use me as a character in one of your next books. Okay. It'd be the stud. <laughs> the <laughs> one, you know, that, 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 you know, has to, you know, sleep with everyone because... Well, you know. I have a little bit of advice to you, Alan. Uh, you just need to buy a bigger phone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get that now. We will. You do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, we can walk away from this show because it's just, it's getting really, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, guys, another terrific interview. Thank you very much for putting me so much at ease. Um, yeah, that's what we, we like talking to you. So uh, now the book is called X for Extortion, yep. and that's, that comes out on September 3rd. Yep. Um, now that will be in paper book, e-book. How yep. does that come? Yeah. Okay. Paper book and e-book. Book. You'll be able to get it from all my other books are in Target, which rather surprises me. I, you know, you go at least sort of a gay presence in, I don't know if they're in 
is it Walmart? Do you have yeah, books yeah. in Walmart? Any? Yep. That would be really, really surprising. But, you know, any local bookstore, you just go in and you give them the title of my name and they can get it in with two or three days because everything's print on demand these days. But it'll yeah. be on Amazon, um, Kobo, Smashwords, all of those normal places. Barnes & Noble, they'll have it in stock. Yeah, but you'd be surprised, Target. And I, you know, the um, we had Saint Suki de la Croix on. You know him with the, yeah, yep. His book. He found his books in Target. They actually are printing them and sending them in. Like they're ordering his books. Uh, I, so. I can tell you a very interesting story. I got a photograph from somebody. People write to me a lot on my website. I'm one of those authors who get lots and lots of emails, um, and I don't know why particularly. But a guy sent me a picture of. The, the first Clyde Smith book, taken on a beach in Cannes, and he happened to be on holiday, and whoever was reading that book had just left it on their towel while they were in swimming. Um, and he recognised, he took a picture of it and sent it to me, and he said, you're famous in the French Riviera. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I said, I, I wanted to write back and say, did you wait for whoever it was to come out of the water? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I won't say, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah, no. Anyway, thank you very, very much. It's been well, great thank fun. you. It's been a pleasure. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.